Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the next two videos, we're actually going to go over very basics of muscle anatomy. We're going to see where some of the major muscles are. We're going to look at the facial muscles and muscles of the head in this video. In the next video, we'll actually look more at the the rest of the body, look at the major muscle groups and some specific muscles there. All right, so here let's look at facial muscles. All right, this is an anterior view, obviously. Okay, so let's first start with the muscles of mastication. Mastication means chewing. Okay, so right here we have the temporalis. Now, a lot of these muscles are going to be named for the bones that they lie superficial to. So this muscle right here is the temporalis. Again, most of these muscles will have a left and a right. Out of the ones you're responsible for this week, there's only a couple, I believe, that don't have a left and right, and we'll mention those as we go. But here's the temporalis. Um, the temporalis is kind of interesting. You can actually feel it contract. If you actually put one finger on your temple, it's a little kind of a, a concavity in, your, in the side of your head, and if you move your finger just a little bit back, a little bit posterior, and you clench your jaw shut, you'll actually feel the temporalis actually contract. It'll get hard. Okay, so that's your temporalis, and actually it's involved in chewing. Mandibular elevation, as we would say. Right inferior to that, uh, beneath the zygomatic process, we actually have the masseter. Okay, so the masseter is actually going to be another muscle of chewing. Um, this is also going to facilitate the same action as the temporalis. So when you clench your jaw closed, that's going to be the action of the masseter. Okay, so the masseter mandibular elevation. So these are your two chewing muscles that we're going to look at in this course. All right, here we have these muscles that kind of go over the frontal bone. They're right above the eyes. There's two of them. These are called the frontalis muscles. Okay, now here it says something a little bit different. Don't worry about this. The frontalis is actually part of a larger muscle called the epicraneus. We used to teach that. We don't anymore. So just know that these two muscles are the frontalis muscles. Um, in fact, when you raise your eyebrows up, that's actually a contraction of the frontalis. And when you raise your eyebrows up, you might notice that your forehead, the skin, kind of crinkles in horizontal lines. That is the action of the frontalis. So this is actually a muscle of facial expression. That's really mostly what it does. Um, and it pulls the skin underneath the eyebrows upward and then in the process moves the eyebrows upward. So these are the frontalis muscles. Now this muscle right here, the orbicularis oculi, is one of two circular muscles we're going to look at this week. The other one being around the mouth. We'll see that in just a few minutes. But circular muscles are kind of strange. There's two things about them. One, they surround holes. Um, now obviously the mouth is kind of a hole. Technically, the eye is also, even though there's an eyeball in there, if you were to take the eyeball out, there would be a hole. And when a circular muscle contracts, it restricts the diameter of that hole. Okay? So if you contracted your orbicularis oculi muscles, it would basically be what you would do when you squint. So whether it's you're looking too much into sunlight, or maybe you squint to see something the further away if you sit far away from the board in your classroom, but when you squint, you're kind of closing the diameter of, your, uh, of the opening of your eye. And so that's what happens when you contract a circular muscle. It constricts the diameter of that hole. Okay? So th these are the orbicularis oculi. They facilitate really just squinting. Orbicularis oris is very similar, but notice there's not a left and right on this because we only have one mouth. Okay, so the orbicularis oris does a similar thing. When you contract your orbicularis oris muscle, it closes or restricts the volume of your mouth hole. Now, that's not just closing your mouth. What it really is is kind of, if you put your lips in the formation that you would if you were gonna whistle, you know, the, when you whistle, you have a really small hole in your mouth, right? That's the action of the orbicularis oris. Also, sometimes it's referred to as the kissing muscle because the motion that you do when you were whistling is pretty much the same as if you're kissing. All right. Then we have this muscle called the zygomaticus. Now, there are actually two zygomaticus muscles. The one that's right here, 
where the arrow is is actually one of them, but this one actually adjacent to it right here, this is another zygomaticus muscle. The one that they're actually pointing at is the zygomaticus minor. You don't need to know that one for this course, but the one, ironically, that it doesn't have the mouse pointed at, or the arrow, I should say, this is the zygomaticus major. Now, in either case, what you should notice is that this muscle is attaching really to the corners of the mouth. It doesn't go all the way around the mouth as it were in the case of the orbicularis oris. It attaches to the corners. And so if you contract these muscles, they pull the corners of the mouth apart, sort of laterally and a little bit upwards. And so I always ask this question, this is the muscle of which facial expression? And it would be smiling. Because when you pull the corners of your mouth laterally and a little bit upwards, that's what you get when you smile. Okay. And again, the one that you need to be familiar with is the zygomaticus major, which is actually this one adjacent to the one that's being pointed at. Okay. The other muscle here that we can see is the sternocleidomastoid. So this is a neck muscle. Um, it's actually going to facilitate neck flexion. So if you were to just kind of move your head and look downwards at your shoes, that would be neck flexion, and the sternocleidomastoid facilitates that. Um, there's actually one on this left side. There's another one on the right side, but it's covered up by this large sheet muscle called the platysma. That's irrelevant. Um, and when you contract both of these sternocleidomastoids at the same time, you get neck flexion. If you contract one of them without the other, that's more neck rotation. So if you actually kind of rotate your head to look to the right, that would be a contraction of your right sternocleidomastoid. Okay? Um, and while we're not going to look at it this week, we'll look at it next week, the reason why you get the name sternocleidomastoid is part of the sternocleidomastoid actually attaches on the sternum, and the other part of it attaches on the mastoid process behind the ears. Okay? That's actually where this name comes from. All right? Now these are all the ones you're responsible for that you can see anteriorly. Um, one of them we'll see on the posterior side um, is actually the occipitalis. Okay? So this muscle right here, there's a left and right on the back side of the head, is the occipitalis. Um, these muscles, again, overlay the occipital bone, which is where they get their name. And this is a kind of a weird muscle. I mentioned a minute ago, when we talked about the frontalis, that the frontalis is actually one part of a muscle called the epicranius. Okay. The other half of the epicranius is the occipitalis. Now, with the occipitalis, it really has the same action as the frontalis. In fact, you cannot contract your occipitalis muscles by themselves. If you were to contract these muscles, you would also get contraction of the frontalis muscles because they're actually linked. They're controlled by the same neurons. They're controlled by the same part of the brain. They can't be contracted independently. And so when you raise your eyebrows up, you would get a corresponding contraction of the epicranius. And really the job that you see the occipitalis doing is it's pulling the scalp backwards. So that's just the skin overlying your head, pulls the scalp posteriorly, okay, back toward your neck, so to speak. But again, that's really what the frontalis is doing. Um, it's just that when the scalp gets pulled backwards, it pulls the skin underneath the eyebrows upwards, and so your eyebrows go upward. But the frontalis and the occipitalis, they do the same thing. They're controlled by the same part of the brain. They're really just two pieces of the same muscle. Most sources will actually classify them as the same muscle. They're both one half of the epicranius, right? So those are the facial muscles and muscles of the head. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of understanding of where the muscles are of the face and the head. Again, this week I'm not going to ask you origins, insertions, or actions. That'll be the following week. You're only responsible here for identifying where the muscle is with a left or right, if applicable. Usually that is. Um, and with the facial and head muscles, I probably will not put them on the little torso models that you used in the lab. They'll be on the big head uh, that you saw over on the side because, again, these are smaller muscles, much easier to point to. Please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications, and in the following video we'll start talking about all the muscles, major ones of the torso, front and back. Thank you.